I'm sitting here today in the home of Walter and Mary Monk on the occasion of the observance of Walter's 100th birthday. Uh, and I've come out here uh, to have a discussion with Walter uh, about his life and career and what has been interesting and fun to do and to answer some questions about uh, people uh, who these days uh, just appear as names in textbooks and to try to understand what uh, he thinks uh, was the best part, most interesting part of his career. So Walter, maybe for people who aren't scientists, if you could just uh, tell us you know, who you are, what you think you've done, what's been interesting, and then we can explore all kinds of things uh, afterwards. Uh, I'm an oceanographer here at Scripps, right next door to where we're sitting. I've been at Scripps off and on since 39. It's a long time. I, my, my career has been very much dictated by circumstances. I'm interested in what's happening and respond to it and, and have had a very good time doing it. And I'm delighted to have Carl come here for the for this okay. interview. Uh, you've given several interviews and written some memoirs. Uh, why don't you just qu quickly summarize your life? You were born in Vienna, I believe in the days in which there was still an empire and an emperor, and somehow you got over here uh, as a st student, you used to call your, kind of described as your playboy years. So how did that all come about? Well, I think the emperor had to abdicate within a month of my birth. <laughs> so I didn't really know any. You didn't know the emperor. Had any intimate <laughs> connections. My mother exiled me from Vienna to America because I was doing very, very poorly in high school. And uh, the reason, I think, was that I enjoyed skiing so much. Let me go back one step. My uncle Felix, my mother's older brother, was an early skier before the days of skiing were so popular. And he taught me skiing as a young boy, and I loved doing it. And I spent much too much time in the mountains and too little time skiing, and I came up with poor grades in high school, and mother was complaining about my performance to some American friends, and they said, well, they had a son just like Walter, who didn't do well in school, and they found the ideal school on Lake George in the state of New York, Silver Bay, for boys who don't study, and I was exiled at the age of 14 to go to Silver Bay and loved it and started a ski club and became the president of the ski club. Mother was very disappointed. <laughs> when, when, when did you discover you were not cut out to be a banker? Oh, I knew that all you along. You knew that all along. I knew that, I knew that all along. But after I graduated from Silver Bay, I did actually work in the New York branch of a bank that my grandfather controlled. There was a branch in Vienna and one in London and one in Amsterdam and one in New York. And they engaged in arbitrage by buying and selling almost simultaneously. <laughs> And making, taking advantage of small price differentials. And with great pride by using Western Union, they were able to do this in a 10 second period or something like that, whereas today it's being done in milliseconds. But as far as I'm concerned, it's equally useless to society 
to do that. <laughs> but I really didn't want to okay. do that. Okay. Well, we, we can come back to your trajectory, which I know <coughs> took you to Caltech and then here at Scripps uh, to work with uh, Harold Sverdrup and Roger Ravel. Uh, you've written a great deal about Sverdrup and Ravel, and uh, these are very well-known scientists. So I thought it might be interesting for you to talk about some of the people you've known during the course of your career who for most people in our field now, uh, and certainly students, are, are just names in textbooks. And uh, there's a few people uh, I think you knew who uh, maybe you could describe uh, what, what they did and uh, uh, what, what kind of people they were. The, the name that comes to mind uh, first is uh, Walfried Ekman. Uh, whom any oceanographer knows by name, but uh, you had some encounters with him, I believe, when he was still active. So may maybe tell us something about what you know of Ekman, what he did, what he didn't do, which is one of the questions. Well, much, much later, after Sverdrup had left Scripps and gone back to Norway, I spent a year in Norway visiting Harold Sverdrup, and at that time I met Aikman, and if I am not mistaken, it was a, a year before Aikman died. And he showed me a paper he had written where they used the so-called Aikman current meter. They had taken readings of currents as a function of depth attaching something like five or six current meters between, on a cable between the surface and the deep sea bottom. And he was very disturbed that the records from adjoining current meters, maybe only a few hundred meters apart, would be so dissimilar, show no correlation. And I and he had not published for that reason, thinking that it was due to some malfunctioning of the equipment that he had built. The, the measurements were made in 1930, is that right? 1930, uh, on the Aikman current meter. And I had had some contact with Aikman current meters because the first sea trip I took was with Roger Rebell and he tried to use an Aikman current meter. I remember he spent all night trying to make the balls fall <laughs> into a compartment. And, uh, and, and I was very impressed with Roger's willingness to work so hard to get things to work. But anyhow, I tried to persuade Aikman that if you have a broad band, broad spectral band signal, it becomes non-coherent within relatively short distances. And uh, that did not necessarily work, mean that the instruments had malfunctioned. And I think I helped persuade him to publish and it was early before his death, yeah, okay. so I'm very pleased. Okay, so he, he published about 23 years after he made the measurements because he was so puzzled by yeah. the signals that, uh -huh. that he had. Okay. <clears throat> One of the questions that people have raised with Ekman is that given that he was quite mathematically talented, which of course shows up in his early work on what became known as the Ekman boundary layer and a dead water, which was internal waves, that uh, he, he didn't do any theory, as far as I'm aware, and most people are aware, uh, after that time. And uh, did you ever talk to him about the, the, the mathematics, for example, of your own paper on westward intensification? I don't think, I think so, Carl. I think we talked about his work. Uh -huh. And uh, he, so and he I, wasn't particularly interested. Uh, I don't think so. And I think what you're saying is probably the 
the correct, the right analysis of his career. Uh -huh. And uh, it was really rather surprising that he went into instrument building. But, but, but he, he thought, looking at the mathematics of the three famous papers, Sverdrup, 1947, Stommel, 1948, and Monk, 19. 50, Ekman clearly had the mathematical skills to have written any of those papers, but did not. Uh, presumably there's some message there of, about uh, having the right surroundings and the right data and observations to, to stimulate uh, the generation of, of theory. Yes. Okay. So uh, m m moving on from uh, Ekman, uh, somebody else I think you knew uh, f fairly well, m probably better, was Carl Rossby. Uh, and you had some interesting comments before about the other Carl, uh, Carl Eckhart, and how different these people were. And I guess they clashed here at Scripps. I is that true? That is correct. Carl Gustav Rossby was very intuitive. And he didn't mind when he wrote papers to uh, occasionally let his guesswork come in. Karl Eckert was totally deductive and was very much annoyed and bothered by someone who wrote papers without following a very strict mathematical discipline. I myself think that Rosby contributed very much more to oceanography than, 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 than Eckhart did. Eckhart wrote a book that's widely forgotten <laughs> on dynamic oceanography. Do you know it, Carl? It, it was an infuriating book that came out when I was a student. And, and what he found is that he in, invented sort of a new nomenclature because he was very much annoyed of how things had been named, partly by Rosby. <laughs> F for Coriolis, why in the world F? <laughs> N for Weissler frequency, etc., etc. And so he wrote a book with a very logical but newly invented explanation of basic symbols. The only fact is, even though Carl undoubtedly had a much more orderly mm -hmm. uh, presentation of the subject, nobody read it because <laughs> nobody wanted to learn a new language. language. Yeah. And there's a lesson yeah. somehow. But yeah. Yeah. As somebody who did try seriously to read it, the problem was the nomenclature. One always had to go back to page one to understand what he meant by any particular symbol, whereas oh, with yes. most books, you can start in the middle and read the part that you thought was appropriate. But with Eckhart, you always went to back to the beginning right. uh, to find it. And, uh, but but uh, I, I do know that uh, Henry Stommel once said that uh, Eckhart had confused vigor and rigor, and that he <laughs> Stommel was more interested in vigor. And of course, he was something of a protege of Rossby. But what, what, what was Rossby like, just as a person to cope oh, with on a day? he was great fun. He was great fun. I once took a, uh, some trips with him from, by train from, from Sweden to Norway. I forgot the occasion three of us went back and I was a fairly poor student and was going to sit up all night so Rosby and the other man, Palmain oh, yes. from Finland, Eric, Eric Palmain. also sat up all night with <laughs> me and I, I thought Rosby was delightful, uh -huh. delightful man and when he came to Scripps for a summer to visit Sverdrup he was in urgent need, Rosby was in urgent need to have someone to listen to his thinking. He was working on a problem and he had to go and find someone to listen to him to get his own thoughts in order. 
So he, he was one of those people who, in some sense, did science by talking about it. That's correct. Right. And one day I received a message, phone message, Walter, Walter, please come down the beach. And he had written some equations in the sand, <laughs> but he ignored tides. <laughs> and the tides were coming in and washing out the equations. <laughs> and I thought it was very amusing. I really enjoyed my relations <laughs> to him a lot. And, uh, how did he come to be interested in the ocean? Because uh, he is generally claimed to be a meteorologist. Well, and he remained generally a meteorologist. Okay. I think he came to La Jolla because he was a friend of Harold Sverdrup. I see. They had been invited. And uh, at that time, he was in Chicago. Oh. Uh -huh. And uh, wasn't so far to go. Okay. Oh, and I should mention that after, later, a little early in my career, I'd been at Scripps for oh, about 10 years. He invited me to join his faculty in Chicago, his meteorologic faculty, and I declined because I liked it in La Jolla. And he, I remember he was very critical. He said, really, Walter, anybody who's anybody changes his job every 10 years or so <laughs> to get new experience. Anyone with any imagination <laughs> changes his job. But I, I did not come to Chicago, okay. and, and I remember that incident. <laughs> well, I think the, t the two of us uh, have both had careers where we never did move, really. No, but, uh, right. we, we, have, we have moved around. And, and Carl Eckhart, though, was an interesting character, uh, a famous physicist. Uh, who had worked, I believe, in quantum mechanics, and he always seemed a little bit of an anomaly here. Uh, was he here because Sver Sverdrup uh, brought him? i forgotten he was. Well, he came here because of the war, oh. and we had started a section of Scripps, the Marine Physical Laboratory, MPL, and uh, Carl eventually became director to do something about anti-submarine warfare, ASW. And uh, that's what brought him here. If I'm right, Carl, he had come close to being considered for the Nobel Prize for his work in quantum mechanics and missed it and uh, was very disappointed about mm -hmm. that, actually. And he came here and he helped, spent a few years here, and helped making, writing some very early good notes about marine physics uh -huh. in, a, in a textbook, in a, in, a, in a book that was published by the Navy, and uh, became head of NPL. It was very curious for a theoretical physicist to come into that position. And he later on became direct, director of Scripps. Uh, that's a different story when uh, Roger Revelle, who was expected by everyone to become the first chancellor of the new UCSD, and when he did not, and when he, I want to be sure I get that straight, when he let, no, I may be uh, mistaken. Yeah, the UCSD was founded sometime in the 1960s. Yes. I, I think uh, Carl Eckert was the director in the late 40s, yes. when everybody did expect Ravel to become the yes. director. And Ravel was That's unpopular right. for... That is correct. With some people, I guess. Yes. Uh, and uh, you've written a great deal about uh, Roger, so uh, yeah. without pursuing that in, in any depth, uh, m m maybe you could say, what was it about Roger, who was one of the great men of science, 
that made him not a suitable uh, uh, director of scripts. Or he came into some sort of a disagreement with the head of our Board of Regents. Oh. And, and Roger was clearly right. Roger wanted UCS, wanted UCSD to be good because it had good people. And he wanted to sort of follow the example of Caltech being mostly a graduate school of good scholars. And the chairman of the Board of Regents wanted UCSD to have a good football team <laughs> and wanted us actually to have our campus downtown San Diego. So those two were irreconcilable I views. I see. And, and, so, and, and at the very basis okay. of that disagreement. So, uh, uh, but uh, with Eckhart then as d director, uh, was that successful or he was a fish out of water? He was a fish out of, of water, water okay. actually, I think. He, probably he did a good job at NPL in connection with the acoustics, but I think his directorship of scripts, yeah, and you're quite right, you reminded me. When Roger did not get the scripts, when Roger was, when Harold Sverdum decided to leave and wanted Roger as his successor, and Roger was the person who'd been very good on seagoing work and observation from oceanographic vessels and wanted to change scripts, which was still basically recovering from being a biological field station to becoming an oceanographic institute. Uh, the biologists here who were the powerful element of Skip's faculty, objected. And they found the reasons why Roger Revelle should not get the job. He didn't answer phone calls. He didn't answer mail. He was slow in responding. All, all, all very fair, as Roger himself would freely admit, but he was a man with many ideas yeah. and great right. imagination. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I should say at this time, I had three heroes in my career, Harold Sverdrup, Roger Revelle, and G.I. Taylor from England, and my discussion of these people reflects the fact that I admired them greatly. Great. Okay. Uh, we could talk all day about Roger, but the mention of GI uh, makes me think of your stays in Cambridge. You had several extended uh, visits to Three. Cambridge, one of which was joint with me. Yes. But well, well before that, you had been there, I guess, new GI and the other Cambridge people. Maybe you would say something about what it is that you admired about GI. Well, let me first say, that my mother studied botany in Cambridge in 1916 and 1917, before the war ended. Eventually had to leave as an enemy alien. And my mother loved her years in Cambridge. It was a very unusual thing for a continental girl to go to a college in abroad in England or elsewhere. And so we had heard about Cambridge all our lives. And <coughs> I loved going there as much as mother had. I spent three sabbaticals in Cambridge. The last one mostly was with, with you. And, um, and they were a very important part of my career. Yeah. Did, did you interact with G.I. Taylor at all? Yes. Not 
not very tightly, but I remember having dinner with him and being very much impressed with his career. And then later on, when he came to Scripps for a summer study with Project Sorrento, it was called, okay. which was one of the early anti-submarine warfare ASW studies, amazing because of the people who came, G.I. Taylor, Tommy Gold, George Batchelor, and others. I got to know him a little bit and admire him. And they came up with very interesting solutions to the submarine problem. Tommy Gold wanted to attach a whistle to an enemy submarine while it was in port so that you could hear <laughs> it make a big sound when it was after the left. And uh, they did, in fact, suggest very interestingly that the wake left behind a submarine should be detectable for a long time. And wrote a paper on that, a classified paper, not quite correct. There is such a wake. It can be identified for a long time. But they assumed that the submarine would leave behind it a paper of uniform density, a sort of a circular wake. And that is not the case. It soon re-established the density stratification. But it can still be identified at remarkably long periods. I don't think the problem is really clearly understood. Sure. Well, um, but uh, re reverting back to GI for the moment, I mean, presumably he was a scientist more in the Rossby mode of yes. being intuitive rather than being. Well, he had a fantastic rigorous. ability to combine observations with theory. Simple observations with simple theory. I have to tell you the story that I uh, attended a meeting in his honor after he had died in Cambridge. And I mentioned to George Batchelor how much I was impressed that G.I. Taylor uh, generally did not stay with a problem if it did not yield. If he did some work for one or two months and he didn't get any deep new ideas about it, that he would drop it and do something else. And George said, now wait a minute, come with me, and took me upstairs and opened up a file cabinet, and it was full of G.I. Taylor's work that he had done when it did not work out, some of it for quite some long time. <laughs> he just had lots of ideas. And I think his strength was simple experiments with simple ideas pursued very actively. Okay. But also the ability to walk away from a problem and if he wasn't getting yeah. anywhere with, with, with it. Okay. Uh, as long as we're on Cambridge, a contemporary of his with whom I know you did interact a little more closely is Harold Jeffries. Yes, uh, I'd like to say a few words about Harold Jeffries. My mother had been at Cambridge, as I mentioned, and she was a student of botany. And who in the world do you think was her professor? It was Harold Jeffries. Jeffries. He was a botanist before he became the leading geophysicist some years later. And when we came to Cambridge, we took our two children, Judith and I, and uh, invited Harold Jeffries for tea. And he came in. We hadn't told him about mother being there. 
and opened the door and met Mother and called her by her maiden name. <laughs> Wonderful remember. memory. And how he, uh, and during the war, he started working on papers having to do with radiology. And apparently that persuaded Jeffreys to, oh. to change his That was view. the first war. World War the I. First war, first yes. one. Okay, because he d he did do some serious meteorological work yes. in that period. But um, but let me say something about Jeffries. He was leading geophysics. His book, The Earth, successive. How many editions were there? Six. Six editions were at one time the Bible of geophysics or the Bible of theoretical geophysics. But then when plate tectonics became a problem and he t turned against it and found some rather simplistic reasons why they were false wrong mm -hmm. and wrote another edition of his book, he sort of lost the leadership. Yeah. Interesting. But the books for a while, while I entered the field, yeah. were the leading geophysical. Yeah. yeah, the first three or four of the editions of the Earth were the, the, uh, were the book. Did, did you ever try to talk to him about plate tectonics? Yes, I've talked to him a number of times. He was very hard to talk to. He was not very, easy to talk with. Very silent. He, uh, I did mention to him the work we were doing on the change in, yeah, he had worked on earth rotation problems very prominently. And I did mention to him that there was an annual term in the length of day. He had worked on the wobble. And I think the only exclamation I've ever heard him give is he said, Oh! <laughs> he was genuinely surprised. And when we wrote our book, when we being Gordon MacDonald and I on the rotation of the earth, and we dedicated it to Sir Harold, he was genuinely pleased. pleased. And um, the, the, the um, uh, work on the rotation of the Earth, of course, did greatly extend what he had done. I, w I would guess that in some sense you dedicated the book to him because he was the father of the use of the rotational measurements uh, in order to uh, make inferences about geophysics. Is that, that is correct. Okay. He, he also had a very nice wife, Bertha Jeffries, whom you yeah. pro probably met. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think she had something to do with the fact that the book stayed in uh, yes, print. She did indeed. Uh, because uh, she was trying to protect <coughs> Harold's legacy and to keep it alive uh, yes. by keeping the books up to date. Yes, she was very, very active in trying to keep yeah. him out. But she was a teacher at Cambridge as well. Yeah. She had been his student, I believe. She'd been a student. Perhaps his only student. But I think she also She was, was uh, an instructor or lecturer in, in Cambridge. Instructor or lecturer. In, in, uh, in, in Cambridge. At, at Newnham, wasn't it? Excuse me? At one of the other colleges. Yeah, one of the other. You know, probably it was, it was Newnham, a woman's yes. uh, college. And uh, she, she had a great deal of mathematical skills of her. That's own, correct. Because there's a very nice book, still useful, Jeffries and Jeffries. Yes. Where Don't you think that's a good book? It, it's uh, a very good book in the traditional English style, yes. like Lamb's Hydrodynamics and Love's Elasticity somewhat formal and dry, but gets right to the point. 
and I always enjoyed uh, reading it because many of the examples were geophysical, yes. unlike, unlike most books on mathematical physics, which yes. is what I think it's called. Uh, yeah. There, a lot of the examples were about the Earth, yeah. and I gradually moved into geophysics myself, partly yeah. because I found things like calculation of heat flow in the whole Earth so, so interesting. Um, so w while on the subject of Cambridge, um, th there was George Batchelor, who was very important as a student of GIs, and he built the department we both visited, Applied Mathematics and Theoretical yes. uh, Physics, which ha had, a, I guess, a somewhat different air to it than uh, the Manningly Rise Teddy Bullard uh, laboratory, which I think you probably visited in the first two yes. times you spent yes. in uh, Cambridge. Yes. Uh, did you have any impression of Batchelor? Because there's a rather nasty discussion of him in Fred Hoyle's autobiography. Oh, I was not aware of that. Well, George Batchelor was his not brilliant and exciting and romantic in the sense of Bullard and maybe even in the sense of Jeffreys. But he became the biographer of of, of, of G.I. Taylor and spent his life really supporting G.I. Yeah, yeah. well, Bachelor's work in turbulence remains very important. Very important. He's, he's a very important uh, figure, yes. but in some, as you say, in some ways a successor to, to G.I. On in the turbulence uh, uh, problem. Right, and uh, his yes. textbook on fluid dynamics remains a kind of a classic of the yeah. field, although in, again in that kind of Cambridge scientific tradition of being a bit, a bit dry. Yes. But all, all, all ri rigorously, all rigorously done. And uh, the, the, the uh, there, were, there were a few other people, um, several other people I could ask you about, but uh, one of the more uh, interesting parts of your career was your ability to apply basically Fourier statistical methods, continuum uh, spectra to a great variety of areas. And of course, the, gr the great pioneer of that, uh, besides yourself, was John Tukey, who I believe vi did visit you, you here. And again, the question of what was Tukey like? Oh, he was a great and very wonderful influence on my career. I remember best when he came and we were building the house we're sitting in and something had not worked with the water pipe coming in from the street and he came up and helped me repair the water pipe. Yeah. <laughs> but he was visiting here. He was and practical. <laughs> he had a, and he was great fun and he taught me Fourier analysis and Paul uh -huh. Spector. And the amazing thing is that no one in America during World War II or before understood how to do spectra of stochastic processes. And, uh, and John Tukey was the one who, who taught me I was working on tides then, and I was interested in, tides are famous for being, having a discrete spectrum with very specific frequencies associated with orbital mechanics. But it also has components that are very weak but stochastic. and. Uh, I was interested in working on that. And John Tukey was very helpful. And at that time, the power spectra were performed by getting the cosine transform of the autocorrelation. And uh, I was, there was a computer at a company called Conbear 
here in San Diego. They had one of the earliest IBM 650 computers. And they offered me free time on their 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. shift, an awful shift. 2, two, two a.m. or 2, two a.m. to 7 a.m. I'm sorry. Not yes. Right. And so I was working on Spectre of Tides. And I would leave the house at 1.30 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> armed with a set of IBM punch cards. Right. I'd go down there and try and do some cosine transforms of autocorrelations right. and then come back for breakfast, <laughs> hopefully with the answer. <laughs> and that was my early work. And I think as a whole, it was quite useful at the time. Yep. Well, the, Bla the blackman tukey yeah. method was what everybody, yeah. what everybody used. But uh, <laughs> do you know how Tukey first got onto continuous spectra? Was it from optics or acoustics? Uh, because it, for a statistician at that <clears throat> time, when he was a very good one, uh, it was a somewhat unusual. I don't yeah. remember how he got interested. Yeah, yeah. Okay, he worked fine. for Bell Telephone. Oh, yes, As a okay. So a private that... consultant all his life. Yes, okay. And I suspect but that was part of the connection. Probably the analysis of acoustic yeah. signals that he, he would have gotten, uh, gotten on, on to that. Um, well, there, there, there were a lot of other uh, people I could uh, um, ask you about. Uh, what, what, what was your impression of my original advisor, Henry Stommel, uh, who, as we both know, did visit Scripps uh, at least for a year back in the 40s. Uh, uh, at least the story, as he tells it, wanted to go to graduate school and was turned down by Harold Sverdrup. Uh, but it is also uh, uh, one of the important figures in physical oceanography of the 20th. Uh, century. Um, what's your take on Hank? Well, he, he was a very important person in my life because the two of us came in after World War II, Hank in Woods Hole and me at Scripps, <clears throat> and we saw each other frequently for the rest of our lives. He was a far better oceanographer than I am, I think. That's a he very different. <laughs> wonderful <laughs> better int intuition about the oceans mm -hmm. and uh, great fun to be with. We were a little bit on the competitive side, but and occasionally got annoyed at each other, but I think as a whole, we're good friends. And I love my getting to know okay. him. And as you say, he came to La Jolla once for a summer. That was not terribly successful. And I forgot why. I, I, I do think that uh, <coughs> in some sense, uh, Hank was a New Englander and uh, the California way of life, of which La Jolla was kind of yeah. the extreme example, uh, <laughs> uh, somehow violated his, his sense of how one should yeah. live, and that kind of affected his relations with people. But he certainly admired you, as you know very well. He sent me out to work with you, and he would not <laughs> have done that with anybody he didn't think was the best in the field. And I'm very grateful for, to him for sending you well, out. Well, as a young graduate right, right, student, right. because you were interested in pole tides, yeah, yes. an obscure <laughs> subject, right. which for good reason no one else had else thought cared. about. 
And so that's the beginning of our friendship. Friendship, right. It lasted all well, our lives. You, 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 you were the expert on time series analysis <coughs> in oceanography. And, and so, suddenly on pole tide. And uh, <laughs> <coughs> the, the pole tide community is, remains a very small one. It may be almost non-existent at this, right. at, at the, the, this point. But uh, actually, that brings me to this computer system that you had constructed here called BOM for Bullard, Ogilvy, Monk, and Miller, I believe which in many ways is reminiscent of the kind of computer capability that we have today with things like Mathematica, which I know you use, and MATLAB, which I use. And uh, how did that come about? I mean, it, w it was for its time a kind of an extraordinary <coughs> step into making computers easy to use. Yes. Well, it came, we developed it entirely because we needed it for tidal analysis mm. and tidal problems we were working on. And there was no such program. And it, it served us well in a few experiments. And then it became hopelessly outdated. Mm. And I, I should tell you the story that in that program, there was a section, it is not well known, that three weeks are missing from the calendar in some century because the Pope, because the leap year had gotten us out of sync with the sun at Christmas, and so the calendar was switched. The you Gregorian calendar. The Julian to Gregorian. Yes. And uh, so those three weeks are not existing <laughs> in the title. Old history. records. And we had a paragraph in our, in, our, in our mom manual that if somebody asked for any date within those forbidden dates, <laughs> it would come back with a statement that said, any son of a bitch knows that those dates are missing from the calendar. <laughs> and I expected a furious phone call at one time or another in my life, but nobody ever came back. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think you once told me that all of your books had, a, had, had buried jokes. And we tried to. We I tried, tried, tried to. to do that. Some I found, but others I don't. <laughs> I probably miss, missed as well. Okay, now I'm going to ask you the question that you put to all of the speakers uh, at the two symposia that are going on in honor of your centennial year is, wh what do you think is going to happen in oceanography in the next 100 years? You, you clearly have lived through, in many ways, an astonishing transformation from oceanography as it was practiced in the late 1930s uh, to the way we do it today. Uh, we've gone from uh, individual uh, investigators going out to sea on ships for weeks and months at a time to vast teams of people, very complicated models, uh, very sophisticated theories which didn't exist. So. Actually, it's two questions. Uh, how, how did you manage to adjust to all of this uh, and stay active right up till the present moment? And what comes next? Uh, well, I think I was extremely lucky to get my PhD uh, at the same time ONR was founded. That's an accident. <laughs> But I worked with the Navy since the very beginning of my career. And we've had a very positive and, to me, wonderful association. And uh, the early ONA was very exploration-oriented. And I really... M meaning? Exploration. Oh, exploration. Exploration-oriented. Exploration. It's an exploitation. 
<laughs> and I really am worried about the new generation of oceanographers to be more modeling oriented, computer modeling or otherwise. I found the exploration age to be so very fascinating and interesting. And the next generation is going to depend less on going into areas that we didn't really understand or know about, but rather on taking systematic time series measurements to, to tie things down. And it's, it's a different thing. I think it's a little bit like we're becoming more like meteorology where you really depend on routine observations taken by other people rather than on measurements <laughs> and observations you took yourself. And I'm a little sorry to, to see that change. And I'm very happy to live in a time when individual exploration was the normal way in which we functioned. It, p part of the change, of course, in fact, perhaps the major part of the change of the last 100 years or the roughly 80 years of your career has been the technological yes. advance. Oh, yes. And um, do you suppose it conceivable that there will be technological advances that took us, for example, from the Nansen bottle, which goes back to before 1900 and the reversing thermometer, which were the mainstays of oceanography into the 1960s uh, to what we have today, satellites and floats and acoustic methods and huge computers. I is it conceivable that there will be further technological transformations uh, that took place? Uh, it's possible that uh, Carl Eckhart, as a, a quantum mechanics expert, could have guessed what quantum mechanics would do for us, because most of what we have is based, isn't it, on quantum mechanics, the transistor, the integrated circuit. Uh, everything we put in the sea today r runs on some kind of quantum yes. principle. Uh, so is there something today where you'd say, oh, by the time 100 years goes by, or 80 years goes by, uh, this will transform the way we can understand the ocean, at least? After all, that was the challenge to the speakers. Yes. yes. <laughs> what's, what's coming? Yeah. Well, clearly, one of the things that will, has revolutionized oceanography is the space work. And uh, that's been enormously important to, do the, to, to, to observe the oceans from space. And I just want to make one comment here. When the first ocean satellite went up, CSAT, a man who had been very essentially developing it, and I forget his name. Here? He wrote a book on oceanography. Giff Ewing? Pardon me? Gifford Ewing? No. Not Giff? Uh, and we can look that up. I have his book out there. John Appel? John Appel, Appel. Who I think is widely underrated mm -hmm. because his book is great. And uh, came to Scripps to tell us about CSAT and what it would do. And, uh, and then went to Woods Hole and gave a speech to them. Did you? Did you hear him? I this? did not hear him. And uh, he talked to one of the physical oceanographers afterwards, not me, who said, I can't think of any way in which these observations from space are going to be helpful in understanding the oceans. It's probably the false, the, 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 the greatest mistake that ever been made. <laughs> and he got similarly not a very warm reception yeah. at Woods Hole. Yeah. 
so um, that the development of satellite oceanography, we can't take any credit for, for that tech. Happening. It was people outside yep. of our real community yep. who, um, who are responsible for that. Uh, oceanographers, particularly seagoing oceanographers, tend to be very conservative. Exactly. I've always thought because they've watched too many people come aboard with a wonderful new instrument and then have it fail in the first look. Yes, you're, but, abs you're absolutely right. And so there, there is a kind of a built-in conservatism that if it's a new idea, it's not going to work. That's right. And that has not helped over the years. Okay. That's right. Okay. And I remember the, 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 the book, The Oceans, by Sverdrup Johnson and Fleming, which in some ways is a Bible of my early yes. existence, has only uh, one brief mention of internal tides. Mm -hmm. We might get to that subject. And internal waves, it's, mm -hmm. Did not you can hardly find it and saying, pointing out that the displacement of the surface of the oceans will be in the ratio of del rho over rho of the displacement in the interior of the ocean, or that that displacement is of the order of 100 meters. So a thousandth of that would be a centimeter. And del rho... Right. Uh, it refers to the difference between ocean and atmosphere. Del rho over rho is about one of us, over a thousand. Mm -hmm. And so the statement in the book says that you could never observe it from, from above, from ships right. or from yep. any other way. Yep. And they couldn't have been more wrong. Well. We do now measure it beautifully, and the observations from satellites right, right. can get up to millimeter limits right. and uh, have been extremely okay. useful. Okay. okay. But so no, no, no guess at the next generation of instruments. Well, I'm afraid it's going to become more like meteorology, sure. yeah. that you will depend on observations taken by oh, others, yes. and uh, very heavily dependent on computer techniques for analysis. And I find it less interesting than the age I went through. Sure. Right. I'm so That's glad right. I was born into right. yeah. the period I was born into. It's, it's perhaps less fun than it used to be. Less fun than it used, used to be. be. So, so Walter, uh, thank, thank you very much uh, for doing this with me and putting up with questions that uh, obviously stress both our memories of many people and, uh, and things. Uh, your formal 100th birthday is October 19, is it? Yes. And uh, so all of us, who we hope will be watching this, do wish you many happy returns. And uh, I expect to have a continued conversation with, with you for a long time to come. So thank you very much.